call the Minot City Council to order for today, Tuesday, January 19th, 2021. It is 5.30 in the afternoon. I would just uh, once again remind everyone to uh, go ahead and put your electronic devices on silent or on vibrate. We'll keep the distractions uh, down to a minimum as I need to quiet my computer here too. I apologize. Uh, let's go ahead and do roll call. Evans? Here. Dancer? Here. Olson? Here. Pittner? Here. Padragula? Here. Ross? Here. Sitma? Here. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Number three on our agenda this afternoon is COVID update. We do have a representative from First District Health Unit here, um, Lisa Clute. If uh, you want to do, uh, if you want to come forward, please. And uh, I think you've got some information for us on the vaccination process and uh, information flow on what and what not to expect on vaccinations. Um, good evening. And thank you for the opportunity to provide a brief update. Uh, it's all about the vaccines these days. We uh, are continuing to test. Uh, we so appreciate the um, testing that you are doing at the fire station. That is um, helping take some pressure off of us and we are moving most of our resources, if not all soon, over to vaccination. So uh, where we're at right now is um, we have in Ward County uh, 27 enrolled provider sites that um, have enrolled to give vaccinations. They may not all be giving vaccines, but they have uh, enrolled, so they may be looking at that. Some of those do include pharmacies. Uh, right now, we have um, administered in Ward County 3,572 doses. Um, we are watching those percentages because our target is 70% uh, to get to a vaccination rate um, to assist us with with slowing this down. Um, so we right now are at about a 5.3%, I think, rate <coughs> within, uh, within Ward County. And we are working at getting a graphic um, and information up so that we can give you those numbers on a uh, very regular basis. So um, <coughs> we can hopefully watch those vaccination rates go up. We are still uh, had a meeting with all of the healthcare providers in our area that are administering vaccine at noon today. Everybody is still in the 75 and older group. Um, there are a few um, providers that are getting close down on their callback lists of the 65 and older, but they would anticipate we're all looking at probably about three weeks before we get into that 65 and older with the two uh, high risk conditions. And there you go, it's right up there, so thank you. Um, so right now we are uh, working hard on the person 75 and older. Medical providers are contacting um, their patients, calling them in and setting up appointments. Trinity is making a lot of appointments as is St. A, Sanford. Um, and we are, will then move into the persons age 65 to 74 with two or more <laughs> high risk medical conditions. Uh, what we have seen is the demand for the vaccine is extremely high. Uh, as fast as we open up these doses, um, they are getting that, or they are making the appointments. Our phones um, are sometimes having trouble keeping up, so uh, just keep calling back, um, and we will 
uh, get to you. First District will have doses again next week. All of those doses have been uh, spoken for. And um, then we are waiting for the next information on vaccine rollout. Uh, private providers will have it um, this week. They are, they are vaccinating. So uh, we continue to coordinate with that. Um, so I guess with that, I would be happy to answer any questions uh, that you have other than how fast is the vaccine coming? And uh, that is the million dollar question right now. I um, met with somebody in uh, virtually in DC yesterday and was trying to get a handle on some of the rollout uh, that we could expect. Uh, we should have better information in about a week, week and a half as to how all of this is going to come out there, you know, right in the middle of this, we have a administrative change um, or presidential change. So, so um, we are keeping on top of that. We are advocating for the information that we need, which is good solid numbers so that we can plan accordingly and uh, working on the second doses. We have uh, started on some second doses in Ward County at this time. We are encouraging people that have had COVID in the last uh, uh, 90 days to possibly wait and be vaccinated and let somebody that has not had COVID uh, receive that vaccine. So. Um, we just have appreciated all of the help. Uh, we are looking at um, changing how we're doing vaccinations, but we're not ready to make that change yet. Uh, currently, we're doing it all by appointment, and we would expect that in about two to three weeks, um, we will not be able to do that any longer, and we'll have to look at some more mass vaccination processes. So that's where that's at right now. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. Thank you, Lisa. Any questions for Ms. Clute at this time regarding the vaccine or other uh, conditions locally? Alderman Patagula. Just a quick question. I appreciate the update. It's very informative. But um, in the past, I know you've had exercises in mass uh, vaccination uh, mm -hmm. settings. Um, how come you're not using those now? Is it, is it lack of vaccine or why? Because it seems like you were trained up very, very well to do that. We are. Uh, there are a couple different uh, things with this vaccine that makes it a little bit more challenging. First of all, uh, the social distancing. Uh, and um, needing to keep people six feet away so it's harder to form those long lines that we typically see. And we're challenged with winter. So we'll be looking at a large indoor space that we can space people out appropriately. The other thing that is unique to this vaccine is we ask people to wait 15 minutes after they've received the vaccine. So we have to have a holding area um, where you're supervised and make sure that everything's fine. And uh, we have not had any problems uh, thus far. Uh, there was in one of our outlying counties, uh, somebody did have an allergic reaction, but the nurses are all carrying EpiPens. And uh, so this one is uh, an observation. It isn't like a flu vaccine or the H1N1 that we could just run them through. And um, now we've got a plan a little bit differently, but we're confident we can do it. We will, um, I mean, we have plans in place, and so it's just a different flow than what we typically use. That explains it perfectly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for Ms. Clute? Alderman Mayor. Ross. Uh, Lisa, in, in respects to the rapid testing uh, that has been going on, has that been available to the nursing homes and assisted living facilities? Do you know? Yes. How uh, long have they been using that? You know, I think it's, it, the way I understand it is it's an individual choice by the nursing home. So uh, nursing homes were um, asked to be testing at least once a week. Some of them have been testing twice a week. Those that have been testing twice a week 
I think those have been the people or the entities that are most often using the PCR tests on the first test and then a rapid test on the second test. That way, because we know that there is some, uh, you know, um, the rapid test has a higher uh, percentage of negative uh, readings or false negatives. Uh, so that way, when they're using both tests, it seems to serve them very well. So. Any further questions for Ms. Clute? Thank you, Lisa. We appreciate you taking the time uh, to be here with us. Uh, Alderman Ross. Uh, at this time, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that uh, the city of Minot follows the state Alderman Ross, uh, before and, you do, uh, I do have a couple the, of recommendations uh, that I'm going to uh, remove, remove the uh, Alderman Ross. I am going to uh, make a few recommendations based on testimony and discussion uh, from the COVID down in Bismarck first. Uh, the recommendations taking a look at the discussion that I've had with First District Health Unit and with Minot Trinity Hospital nursing and uh, administrative staff with the continued by next testing and the fact that we are still not deep into tier 1B, it would make sense to continue the city mask mandate for one, one month to be reconsidered at the February 16th regular meeting. So a little less than one month from now. Uh, I would look again at the answer that I had testified as what is an appropriate time for the either removal of the mask mandate or uh, other actionary items. And that is the tier 1B, the at-risk population of the 65 and older, and also the paired with infection rate being at a reasonable level, and also uh, the continued accessibility of vaccination moving forward as Ms. Clute had pointed out. That would be my recommendation uh, moving forward for the discussion. Alderman Evans. Um, I would uh, move that uh, the council uh, accept that recommendation and make the motion to extend um, the mandate until um, and review it at our next meeting, uh, not next meeting, two from now, February 16th, 2021. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderman Olson. Typically, we take uh, open discussion at the end of the meeting, but considering with COVID-19, uh, we'll open this up to the public discussion first, uh, and then we'll come back to the uh, council for full discussion uh, and then uh, a, a vote on that. So uh, first, I would uh, ask for all of those uh, opposed to uh, the recommendation coming forward as uh, it has been a mix of emails and telephone calls over the last uh, 24 hours. So if uh, those that are opposed to the continuation of the mask mandate, uh, you're welcome to come to the podium right now. Just uh, state your name and city of residence, and uh, you have uh, up to five minutes of your time to uh, make your opinions known. Uh, Alderman Pittner. Can I just have a point of clarification, Mayor? <clears throat> yes. If we don't make this motion or if this motion isn't passed, the mask mandate is still in effect, is it not? Doesn't it coincide with the state of emergency? The change in the language, Alderman Pittner, thank you for clarifying, would be that uh, the reconsideration of this at the February 16th um, to either continue or to repeal. That is the main main point. So though. we're just setting a deadline on, on the mass mandate, a potential deadline. Okay, just wanted to make sure I was clear on where we're at. Thank you for that clarification. Your name and city of residence for the record, please. My name is Tiffany Fettig and Minot is my city of residence. Uh, Mayor Sipma and council members, thank you in advance uh, for your attention to my testimony on this issue. Uh, as I stated, my name is Tiffany Fettig. I've been a resident of Minot all my life. I'm a business owner and my husband and I have three children. One of our children has multiple medical conditions. My 13-year-old daughter has had diagnosed medical conditions since she was one years old. As parents, we have worked diligently and exhausted many therapies to find treatments that would help our daughter. I am sure any of you that have children would have done the same or have done the same. She has been put through countless tests, pokes, procedures, therapies to find treatments for her conditions. When COVID began, we knew nothing about how the virus would affect her 
and we um, took many precautions to limit our exposure. As time went on and we learned that the COVID survival rate was greater than 99%, we decided it was more important to live than to stay in hiding. This is when COVID got really hard. You see, due to our medical conditions, we have been advised that our daughter not wear a mask. Many of you may be thinking, that's easy. You have a medical exemption. I'm here to tell you, from our experience, that's been anything but easy. First, the challenge began with the school. My daughter's school itself worked to accommodate our daughter early on, but it was not without a ton of anxiety for us and our daughter. She struggled with, not, with wanting to go to school, but being concerned about how she would be treated because she was not wearing a mask. This is mask shaming. Just this last Sunday, we were in Target shopping and a middle-aged male, shop, male fellow shopper said to me, she doesn't have a mask on. I said, yeah, she's exempt. He proceeded to shout profanities at us and tell us I didn't care about people and I was a stupid, bleeping, dumb, I can't even say the word here. Imagine your children listening to the way this person treated us. The situation I have described above is just many, one of many we've experienced. So while I'm sure that you can agree that this is an unfortunate situation that my child has endured and that there are many others like this in our community, I'm here to also communicate that now we know more about COVID, we must stop the madness. As of today, according to the North Dakota Department of Health website, we have 1,234 active COVID cases in the state. According to the U.S. Census Bureau in 2019, we had a state population of 762,062 people. This makes our current active case rate in North Dakota 0 0.001620. That's right, 0 0.001620. In North Dakota, according to the Department of Health, we have had 1,100 or 1,386 deaths marked as COVID-related deaths. According to the numbers, if you do the math, that is a COVID survival rate of 99.99%. Do these 0.001% of lives matter? Of course they do. But you, so should all the other statistics that are not being reported that are occurring due, due to the COVID lockdowns. It's a balancing act and it's currently out of balance. Mayor and council members, I challenge you to consider these questions as you vote tonight. Is the continuation of the mask mandate for a virus with a 99.99% survival rate in our state necessary? If people think masks protect them, can't people choose to wear a mask even though there's not a mandate? Do the benefits of the mask mandate outweigh all of the other things that come with the mandate, including the shaming, the bullying, the anxiety, and more? Do you understand your mask mandate requires the people that have already had COVID to still wear a mask? Why? Why do they need to wear a mask? If today isn't the end of the plan for mask mandate, then when is it? It, is it has been stated that the rate of infection is high in other states. So we should continue to wear masks just in case. It was predicted we would have a surge after Thanksgiving, after Christmas, after New Year's. What event are we waiting for to ask to end the mask mandate? Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Thank you. Anyone else to come forward and speak in opposition of the mask mandate continuing? Your name and city of residence, please. All right, greeting city council members. My name is Jasad Stewart, and I've been here a couple times before to speak on this. Um, I guess for starts, the governor has uplifted this tyrannical order, and so I'm encouraged by that, and yet for some reason the city council, I heard what you said just a moment ago, you think it's reasonable, Mr. Mayor, but I don't think there's anything reasonable about masking everyone over this virus. We, we've never handled communicable diseases like this in Minot. And like I've said before when I was here, uh, there are doctors that are being suppressed by the media. So I wanna know, since I came here last, have you looked into any of the doctors that are decrying against this? Because this is 
theft. You are robbing people from our liberties to breathe air without being muzzled. So I, I, my question for the council, have you looked into doctors who have been speaking against this, especially with immunologists who have been saying, take zinc, take vitamin D, all the tests of, of countries that are doing phenomenally well without lockdowns, mask mandates, et cetera, who have been doing uh, these, these um, suggesting that the constituents and the people in their, in their care just take, you know, the, the responsibility to take care of their bodies. So my question is, have you been looking into, one, the doctors, and how about Event 201? There's way too many red flags with that. So first question with the doctors that have been decrying against this, but have been suppressed. Have you been looking into them for any counsel? Uh, Mr. Stewart, I'll just answer for myself. I've continued uh, discussions with our local all of our local health officials mm -hmm. at all times possible. That is my answer. Okay, and clearly the locals here are drinking the Kool-Aid of this narrative that we need to muzzle everyone. So no, it's just, it's just local. You're not looking out and saying what's working in other places? Because this isn't normal. And we look at America and the decadence of society, we are in the middle of God's judgment and he's being very gracious right now. And I, I love my loved ones, um, I have a daughter, and I know that she's gonna have to grow up one day and she's gonna have to fight tyrants with the word of God. And I, I need to mention this too, separation of church and state. I've heard this, this is not in our constitution, but the principle is biblical. When President Thomas Jefferson wrote this uh, to a Baptist church, what he meant by that was that you don't give, that there, there shouldn't be a federal church Okay, the people have the right to worship, do service, do church discipline based on their convictions. And so a lot of our forefathers left uh, places with religious states. And so uh, separation of church and state does not mean we leave righteousness out of question. We don't leave God's counsel out of the question, okay? I mean, by what standard are you using? You, you say, ultimately, I'm listening to medical doctors here. Have you looked into, into Leviticus 13 and 14? They had cloth back then, plenty of it, when they left Egypt. And nowhere in it, two chapters dealing with disease in communities, do they say, lock down the people, muzzle everyone's face, and start sectioning out people. You're essential, you're not essential, you're essential, this is wicked. And I want to encourage you, you, you have an honorable role. And I, and I, and I want to say that I, I, I love my city council members. I'd like to meet some of you in person. I've given some of my contacts, uh, I mean, and even Chief Klug. I'm, I'm trying to engage with you guys. Um, but I, I feel like when God's mentioned, you know, I don't want to deal with that radical. What is so radical about justice and righteousness? This is why also I said it, 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 worldview matters and, and, and public policy matters. Morals, it's a, this is a moral issue. We ought not to muzzle people. And I'm speaking not for myself. I'm speaking for my children. I'm speaking for my loved ones. I'm speaking for the elderly and uh, young adults who have to go to school, who have people with authority above them who aren't listening to their voice. Um, I saw your hand go up, Mayor. I was just uh, one minute, you're down to a Oh, I appreciate that. So uh, with that being said, Event 201, anything on that either? Have any of you heard of it? Is that scary to talk about? Bill Gates, the World Economic Forum in October, there was a simulation of a coronavirus in October 2019, and a month later we have the outbreak in Wuhan, China. I'm, I'll conclude with this. There are hidden machinations behind this whole farce. And if we don't start taking interposition at local levels, rather than propagating a false narrative and bearing false witness against our neighbors, we will continue to crumble as a nation. And so I, I would just wanna exhort you to truth. Let's have this discussion more outside of here. Obviously five minutes isn't enough to have a nice rational dialogue. So I appreciate the time. Uh, please consider these things. May light prevail. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Again, this is an opportunity for anyone to come and speak that is opposed to uh, the mask mandate continuing.
Hello, council members. My name is Jimmy Van Hus. I'm a Minot resident. I was active duty Air Force for seven and a half years. I was stationed here at Minot Air Force Base. My role in the Air Force was bioenvironmental engineering, and it's really a big conglomerate word, just basically like OSHA and the EPA rolled into one. I was also an emergency hazmat responder. Uh, some of my roles and responsibilities were to mitigate all kinds of hazards from chemical, biological, radiological. Uh, we were the, the experts on base in terms of personal protective equipment, as well as engineering controls to mitigate different types of hazards. Uh, and never in my role in the Air Force would I ever recommend a cloth mask or even a surgical mask for that matter for protection or for mitigation. I'll speak specifically on a surgical mask because a cloth mask that's made in somebody's kitchen is absolutely, has no, no efficiency whatsoever of protecting against anything. However, a surgical mask is designed for a specific task and that's to be in a sterile environment and it does protect against large droplet size such as blood splatter, bodily fluid uh, going in, into the doctor's mouth or the doctor from having debris fall from his nose into you know, an open wound that he's, he's working on a patient. Uh, however, the virus lives in a submicron size and a micron is one millionth the size of a meter or 25 thousandths the size of, a, of an inch. So very, very, very small particle. Your surgical mask does not, it's, it's ineffective at, at mitigating that small of a particle. Uh, I, ha I have a video that you can, you can watch. It's from August, Augustin uh, Surgical. They show you know, uh, an ad that they're basically advertising a ventilation system that they have, but they use a surgical mask and blow blue chalk and show that it's you know, basically being sucked in through the medicine. And they have a, uh, a paper filter there and the, the chalk is all over the filter. And that's because the mask provides zero protection. It doesn't mitigate either because like I said, it's for large droplet sizes, not fine particles. So it, what, what we're seeing here is irresponsible and reckless to tell people to wear these masks. Number one, it gives people a false sense of security. Uh, people that may not need to go out are gonna be going out now. And the other thing is your recommendations about going to a, a restaurant, wear the mask, sit down, take your mask off, there is nowhere in, in this world you're gonna see somebody tell people that this is a hazardous environment, take your mask off, it's safe to eat now. That's just not realistic. That's by any means. And by telling people that they have to wear a mask when they leave their, leave their home, you're essentially saying that it's all a hazardous environment as soon as you walk out the door. So why would you ever tell them that it's safe to take the mask off to have a drink? It's, it's safe to eat in public without the mask on. I mean, you're contradicting yourselves with, with those kind of mandates and recommendations. And I can't tell you why the CDC and you know, the local agencies here are making these type of recommendations because they don't make sense. And I will, I will read one thing from an infectious disease doctor here. Let me pull it up. She just wrote this back in June of 2020. And I'll have trouble pronouncing her name, but her name is Dr. Lisa Brasos and she's an infectious disease expert, and she wrote, what we're seeing is a lot of magical thinking, a lot of wishful thinking. Cloth masks are wishful thinking. And it's because, like I just said, there is zero protection factor or mitigation factor with any of these masks. Unless you're wearing a NIOSH-approved respirator, you're doing absolutely no good. And if you're gonna wear a NIOSH-approved respirator, there is strict guidance on what you're gonna have to follow. You need to be fit tested, number one. You need to be trained on the, um, limitations of the mask, you know, you're not gonna wear a, a particulate matter mask for spray painting. You need to have a specific cartridge for that. You need to know those limitations, otherwise you're gonna be ineffective in wearing the mask. At this time, I'd like to take any questions that the council may have for me. Any questions for uh, Mr. Van Hus, uh, Alderman Ross? We talked earlier on the phone. Yes, sir. And uh, talk about, um, you know, you, you made recommendations to, uh, to Air Force staff, but you also made recommendations and you trained doctors, Air Force doctors. Yes, sir. In PPE and respirators. Talk yes, about sir. that. And we, we did not train them on surgical masks because in my, my uh, career field, we don't even see that as any type of protection factor. It's more of like a voluntary use type thing. 
and like I said, it has a specific use in a sterile environment where the doctor is going to be, you know, cutting somebody open or something like that. It keeps debris from the doctor's nose from falling there, or if the doctor's speaking, like large droplets of spit coming out. But when you're talking about virus and bacteria, you're talking about a very fine particle size, and that mask is absolutely ineffective in that. And there's plenty of, of research from the CDC back in 1993 uh, from different journal medicines all over the world that, that state what I'm saying. Now, you're not going to find that in 2020, any kind of study that says that. They're now trying to say that, oh, these masks are magically somewhat effective. It's better than nothing. Well, that's not true. In, in my area of expertise, we don't live in it's better than nothing. You either wear a mask that protects you or you don't wear a mask at all. So I hope I answered your question there. Thank you. Alderman, Alderwoman Evans. Um, so what is the current Department of Defense who oversees 1.3 million active duty members? What is their position for their active duty members on military installations in the United States and across the world? I'm pretty the sure they're drinking the Kool-Aid as well, ma'am. But... So the nobody, whole Department oh, of Defense is drinking the Kool-Aid. No, nobody's doing their own research. Okay. Like I said, you can read studies that date so back. So the Department of Defense does not have medical experts within it that they do, are there, doing. There's, there's doctors that are being silenced, just as this individual said. So there, there, people that are speaking out against this are being silenced. And I can't tell you why that is. So would you advise Colonel Walters, our base commander, um, you know, 12 miles down the road to lift the mask mandate he has Absolutely. put on the active duty members? Absolutely, I would. Okay, thank you. Any, Any other questions? questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Again, this is an opportunity for anyone to come forward and speak that is op opposed to the continuation of the mask mandate. If not, I would look to those that are in favor of the continuation of the mask mandate for the period that it is identified. those that are in favor. If not, I would look to the council for comment. Any discussion on the motion? Alderwoman Olson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I guess I don't even really know where to start because I do have a lot of thoughts going through my head and a lot of them are based on the communication that we have received over the last 48 to 72 hours. Um, regarding this. We have a lot of people who are passionate on both sides. Um, and I want to acknowledge that passion from both sides because I think both sides have legitimate arguments. Business owners who have lost income over the last year due to this virus um, want to get their businesses back to normal. They want to make money. Uh, one individual called and said a mask mandate puts a fear in people, that they're, they're still very cautious about particularly entering um, a restaurant or a bar um, because they just they don't feel safe. The, the idea is that um, it's not a safe environment to be in. So I understand that. Um, and I can understand a, a parent of a child with, with anxiety or other health issues wanting this to go away as well because they want things to be right for their child and, and I acknowledge that as well. Um, but I think we also have to acknowledge the fact that when people were wearing masks, our numbers declined. And you know, I guess you could argue those statistics whichever way you want, but I see it as a success. Um, we were in a very precarious situation about two and a half months ago and our numbers are so much better. And I have to attribute that to mask wearing. When I voted in favor of a mask mandate, I wanted to see three things. I wanted to see schools open, I wanted to see businesses open, and I wanted to see capacity at our hospital. And we are achieving that, and I don't want that to go away. Um, a, a personal story, some of you are aware that um, recently my mother passed away. Um, I got to be with her in her last days and I got to see her take her last breath at our own hospital. She didn't have to be somewhere else because we had capacity in Minot. And I got to be with her because our numbers had declined. Had that situation been occurring six or eight weeks prior to that, I would not have had that privilege and she would not have that support. Um, so I have to be thankful for the masks in that. 
So <laughs> with all of these thoughts, Mr. Mayor and Council, I am in favor of continuing this for 30 days and have us look again in 30 days to see where we're at. If we get further into tier 1B, I'm gonna feel a lot more comfortable in lifting this mask mandate. I know one caller um, today asked if we would sunset it in 30 days and I don't feel comfortable saying that now because we don't know exactly where we'll be in 30 days. But tonight when we vote, I plan on voting to um, approve your recommendation, sir. Further discussion? Mr. Mayor. Alderman Ross. First of all, I wanna thank those that showed up um, to speak on this uh, this topic it is it's heated it's uh, emotional on both sides um, uh, and I think we all know that uh, you know the first time I came up for a vote I voted against it and I was actually contagious with COVID at the time that I voted against it um, there's so much skepticism out there right now you know it was we were told two weeks to slow the spread well now it's 10 months and uh, Mr. Mayor is asking for 30 more days and I'll bet money that it's gonna be longer than 30 days because there's always gonna be an excuse to extend it. Whether it's the, uh, whether it's the new strains coming out or we're not at that level. So, you know, by putting 30 days on it, um, so many people don't believe that. Between the, the first time we implemented the mask, date, mask mandate, we know so much more. We know that this is treatable early on. We know that there are studies, peer review studies, that indicate an early treatment can cut deaths fivefold and can cut hospitalizations by 84%. It's treatable. I had to talk to a doctor in New Mexico when I had COVID and I had to get a prescription for the Zelensky uh, protocol from Florida. I took them and it worked. It works. And now after all this time, they're starting to say, hey, maybe this is something that works. Maybe this is something that works. Vitamin D. We're, we're learning so much more about science and about this process. We all have heard and we've all talked, we, everybody up here on the, the dais has heard someone call or email them about the curves. Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota. Minnesota's got stricter, is stricter than North Dakota and South Dakota hasn't got a thing, but if you look at the bell curves, they're all the same. I looked at the state of Minnesota and I think I saw maybe three cities that had a mask mandate. Um, Minnesota or South Dakota has never had a mask mandate. And they seem to be doing pretty well. Council person Olson mentioned about small business too. We've put this, we've put this on the backs of small business for way too long. What we don't realize and what we have yet to realize is the stress, the mental stress this puts on the family that owns a small business in this community. Millions of dollars are lost. Millions of dollars. That's millions of dollars that's not gonna pay someone's rent. That's millions of dollars that's not gonna pay a mortgage. That's millions of dollars that's not gonna buy groceries. Millions of dollars are lost. We have no idea the impact this is going to have. Businesses are riding on the edge of a knife right now. It's time to take personal responsibility. Let's put it in the hands of the people. Let's respect the small businesses that have their own mass mandate. Let's respect them. And I do. But let them make that decision and let me make the decision. Look, if I live in fear, I can sit at home and I can get absolutely everything I need to live offline and delivered. The city of Minot doesn't have 
a mandate for running into a burning house, but I'm not going to run into a burning house because I know I'm going to get burned. Let the people make that decision. Give the power to the people. And once again, just talking about the mental health issues. The children, the depression, the domestic violence. Man, we just got to get things back to normal. I fear 75% of the deaths in Ward County happened in an assisted living or a long-term care facility. One of my fears is that a year down the road, two years down the road, we look back at this and it's going to be decided or possibly determined that there was something we could have done to save those people. Your parents, your grandparents, and if that day ever comes, man, that's going to be ugly. We've got to change it. We, we've got to lift it. We've got to give it back to the people. Minor public schools have been masking since the beginning of the year. Why are kids still getting sick with colds, strep throat, when they're wearing a mask every day? Why is that happening? The state made a decision, and they made a decision, and they didn't take it lightly. They made a decision that could potentially affect 650,000 people. You think they took it lightly? I don't think so. Any further discussion? Alderman Pittner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, when this first came about, I guess, um, back uh, when we first implemented the mask mandate, I voted against it. and. Um, I cited a lot of reasons. Um, again, I, I don't think, well, one, I, I, I don't truly believe this is a mandate. There's no wear a mask or, or else. There's, there's no repercussions. There's no, there's no penalty to it. This is, this is a ra mask recommendation uh, at its best. Um, and, and, I, and I think whether, the, whether this has been the cause of the, the reduction in numbers and cases and, and, and deaths and, and, and positive cases, I don't know. Um, uh, like Alderman Ross had said, you've got states like South Dakota that have never had a mask mandate, and they've got they had a bell curve as well, and they're on the downswing as well. I mean, again, I don't know, um, and and that's what's exhausting about this, and and it's it, it, it what's exhausting is it how how politicized this has become, how 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 there's a there's a correction either you're you're for mass or you're not for mass. There's no in between. Um, it's it, it pits people against each other. Um, there's there's a disagreement on, on masks within my own home. Um, I'll be completely honest. Uh, it, it's just, it, it is what it is. Uh, um, but again, it, I don't think people are stupid and I don't think it should be illegal or, or mandated for, for people, uh, against people who, who want to be stupid. If you want to take your risks into your own hands and not wear a mask and not wash your hands and not eat healthy and, 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 and not exercise. And, and when I get emails and calls and texts from individuals uh, unhappy with my decision last time for not supporting the mask mandate, but rather leaving it in the choice of individuals or business owners, which is where it's going to be effective. I mean, again, if people think that a mask mandate, uh, um, the city needed to issue a mask mandate, Menards was doing it, Home Depot was doing it, Target was doing it, Walmart was doing it long before anybody else was. Um, they work at that level because at the end of the day, I still have things I need to do. I still need to live my life. I'm gonna take the precautions necessary to get into the store and, and, and do what I need to do. But again, how, how many times do you walk around Menards or go to a restaurant like the individuals that said, you, you sit down and then and then we're, then we're talking like this. Or you, you get past the door at Menards and you pull the mask and they're walking around the store with it around their neck. How effective is it really? I, I, I don't know. Uh, I was in South Dakota this past weekend uh, with my family, visiting family, and, and it was the same thing. No mask mandate, but people were wearing them. Businesses were, were requiring them or, or requesting them. Um, this is a recommendation at, at, at best is, is what we're doing. Um, 
I would prefer to leave it in the hands of, of those jurisdictions, whether it be a business owner, whether it be a school district, whether it be a park district or the county. I would rather leave it in their hands. Uh, I, I think it's, I think, again, we, we see what this can do to a community and, and tearing it apart and becoming divisive because it becomes, because it comes from a political entity. Um, I think if it came from a business, and at the end of the day, you, you can't be a jerk when you go into a business and say it's my right not to wear a mask. If you have a medical exemption, that's one thing. But if, if a business is asking that you wear a mask, you got to wear a mask. It's their business. It's their house. If I tell you to take your shoes off and you come to my house, you better take your shoes off or you're going to be asked to leave. Um, again, it comes, it comes down to being a good neighbor. It comes down to taking care of fellow citizens. Um, I, I, again, I... I would rather see this in, in, in the hands of, of individuals and individual businesses and let them choose for themselves. Uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather not be so politicized and, and divisive when it comes from us. Um, and, and I won't have a whole great deal of heartburn if, if we stick with it uh, one way or the other. Uh, Bismarck, if I'm correct, and someone correct me, I don't believe Bismarck's mandate is still in effect. Um, so so uh, um, it'll be two case studies, I guess. Um, uh, Bismarck and Minot. So um, I won't support it tonight. I never supported it in the past. Um, I, I would support a mask recommendation because that's a, that's essentially what this is. This is not a mandate. This is not a wear a mask or else. So at, at the end of the day, in my opinion, this is my opinion. This is posturing and it's it's pandering to uh, trying to make feel, people feel protected when when we're really not doing anything because people aren't wearing the mask when they're asked to half the time. So. as we've had lengthy discussions about this in the past, one of the components of the discussion in the past didn't include what transpired in, well, right before Thanksgiving into early December, when the discussion that was being had with our medical professionals about being on the brink day to day on whether or not capacity could even be maintained at the hospital, whether the morgue or the funeral homes had enough space that they were creating extra storage in their outside garages for temporary storage of loved ones who had passed away. That came shortly after the mask mandate, seeing as there is a, a time period before really we started seeing those numbers decline. Health officials have said from the beginning that the mask is not the cure that social distancing, that hygiene, proper eating, nutrition, it, it all plays together. Personal responsibility is one of the biggest aspects. Uh, the Mayor of Devil's Lake had addressed those that have medical conditions. Uh, and uh, they had put a group of volunteers together separately from the city that put together pins that said, I can't wear a mask. And for those individuals at Walmart to Target or kids, uh, they wore those buttons because they couldn't wear a mask. And it was well received in Devil's Lake. I don't want to regress to where we were right before Thanksgiving into early December. The businesses have been hurting. I've talked to quite a few of them. And it is almost a 50-50 split on who wants to keep the mask mandate in place. And Alderman Pittner, you're correct. It's more of a recommendation because we do not have a penalty. But it would be a shame this close with vaccination rollout. So close, and yet we don't have a definitive timeline. And that's why I do want to have this revisited in 30 days, because I want to have that knowledge that if we're going to roll back this mandate, that at least we have the at-risk population addressed before we roll this back. Because absolutely, we've seen with the younger population, most, the majority, are able to handle it better than the at-risk population that are older or underlying conditions. Uh, I'm, not a I'm not a fan of masks. I don't know too many people that uh, look forward to putting it on uh, when they go to work or going into a store. I know I don't. I know everybody's tired. I said this at the Capitol today. Everybody's tired. They want life back to what it was before COVID. It would be a, it would be a crying shame to have a substantial regression as we're rolling out a vaccination. And to the point, I understand there's still a lot of unknowns out there. But I would prefer we revisit this in 30 days when we address 
that population with the vaccination and not have to face what we uh, what we saw in November and December. And it is a it is a small ask for most. It is a tall order for others. To that, I do apologize. But I also know a lot of people that have called me early on in this progress before the mask mandate and accused me personally of killing their loved one because the masks, masks weren't worn and their loved one contracted COVID and they died. Those are tough pills to swallow. A lot of consideration goes into this and I certainly don't take it lightly. Any further discussion? Alderwoman Evans. Um, so there, to be sure, there is no doubt our businesses have been severely impacted by COVID. Um, I think a large reason why our local businesses have been impacted is the posture that our Air Force bases had to take because of our behavior downtown. They have been on HP Con B plus um, since the late spring. This means they cannot come into restaurants, they cannot come into bars. You talk to bar owners, that has been devastating to our bar industry and our restaurants. They can do carry out, but they can't come and, and people spend more money sitting in a restaurant than they do carrying out. And you better believe Colonel Walters and his team are watching what we're doing tonight because he wants to lift, you know, their and move their HP con status as much as we want to get to a place where we don't have to wear masks. And his airmen and their families since March have not been able to go inside of restaurants and bars. They cannot go to Minot Toros games because we cannot all wear masks. They cannot go to Minot State basketball games because we do not all wear masks. They not only make the sacrifices to protect our freedom and democracy, they are making sacrifices because we in Ward County and in Minot have failed them. And so I am voting in support of this so we can get our airmen and their families closer to being able to be back in our community and going out to nightclubs and to restaurants. And that's not gonna happen if our numbers go up. Colonel Walters is gonna have no choice but to keep his airmen in the status they're in. So I want to see them back in our community and I am gonna vote to extend this for 30 days. Further discussion? Last call. The motion is continued to 30 days revisited on uh, February 16th, 2021 at our regular meeting. Please call the roll. Evans? Yes. Stanford? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? No. Hajibula? Yes. Ross? No. Sitma? Yes. Motion is approved. That takes us to our next item, which is our city manager's report. Mr. Harold Stewart. Uh, Harold, before you get going, though, I do uh, uh, well one want to welcome you for those who uh, haven't met you, but two, uh, just inform the council that Mr. Stewart uh, had his opportunity to make his debut down at the state capitol today, uh, testifying in a couple of different bills. I'll touch on those a little bit later, but uh, uh, for your first time around, fantastic job, and uh, thank you to staff as well for helping uh, draw up testimony on that. Uh, so anyway, go ahead, Mr. Sure. Stewart. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and, and Alderman. Uh, in your packet this evening uh, is included a, a, a first city manager memo. Uh, it is still a work in progress, but this is um, our efforts. As I've met with each of you one-on-one, -on -one, there was uh, some mutual uh, concern with regards to making sure that you guys are informed on the, on the operations of the city as an organization. And so this is... Um, I've found this very effective in previous communities I've been in. And, uh, and so department heads have been tasked that uh, at at least one of the council meetings each month that there is a report from their department here that gives you highlights, executive summaries of things that are happening throughout the community and throughout the organization from the perspectives of those departments. It is by no means meant to be a comprehensive, uh, fully detailed report, uh, but it is meant to be an executive summary to keep you uh, informed and if you need further information you're welcome to ask. Uh, it also includes um, uh, each each council uh, city manager memo will include an update from from myself uh, every meeting uh, so that you're aware of the things that I'm working on and things that I are feel of, of concern and, and of importance to you as a body uh, going forward and that is available to the public as part of the packet. Um, so if there's any questions any of the public is welcome to ask any questions. Uh, that will probably substitute as a 
actual presentation for me at each of these council meetings, so that'll be provided to you in advance. And if uh, when this time comes up, if you have any questions uh, regarding the memo, I'd be happy to answer those in open session during the meeting or uh, outside of the meeting uh, as you see fit. Um, just some updates uh, of things that have, have happened. Uh, Minot is a busy place, and so, uh, so as soon as that packet is put together, uh, things continue to occur that are not included. Uh, so most of the public is probably aware of uh, some recent impacts uh, to our community uh, with the Lutheran Social Services Housing LLC um, filing bankruptcy, and uh, they were a significant part in some of our efforts here within our community as far as developing uh, a homeless shelter and some uh, low to moderate income housing within our community and part of our projects. Uh, city staff was uh, just as surprised as the rest of the public when that came out. We had no prior indication that that was in the works and that was going to happen. Um, but since, since those announcements late Friday, uh, city staff has, has done an admirable job of reaching out, connecting, uh, getting information and, and trying to find ways that we can continue to have a solution to provide these services uh, within our community as we've committed as part of the funding that we've received, but also more importantly, the needs uh, in these services for our community uh, of Minot specifically. Um, and then finally, uh, as the mayor alluded to, uh, I did have my opportunity to go and speak on a couple of bills in the state legislature. I, I testified on behalf of three of those bills uh, this morning. Uh, it was a busy weekend, even though it was a holiday weekend, uh, putting together testimony, getting those submitted and, and working on those. Uh, but uh, mainly spoke uh, with regards to some of the bills that are being proposed with some potential changes to uh, property tax structure and limitations. Uh, it does appear that at this point, uh, there's been an amendment that will probably be the lead uh, asking for a study with regards to property tax across the state and considering all factors with relation to that. Uh, the, the North Dakota League of Cities and uh, the North Dakota League of Counties have both spoken in favor of that uh, idea and suggestion of doing a study. And I think that would be a good idea. And, and um, part of my testimony today was, was committed that anything that the city of Minot can do to support that study, we, uh, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, we are sensitive to um, the needs and the, of the discussion uh, for, the, for our public. Uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we have a sustainable revenue to continue to provide the services that our community expects from us with regards to public safety and infrastructure uh, that makes Minot the healthy community that it is. And so we want to make sure that's uh, continuable for the foreseeable future. Uh, with that, that concludes my report for this evening, unless the council has any questions uh, with regards to the memo or anything that I have not addressed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stewart. I just did want to add one component on there. Uh, as I think uh, right before you were testifying, I did happen to uh, have a discussion with the sponsor of one of the bills who had made the amendment uh, for the study. Uh, one of the main pieces, and I actually would uh, even look to staff uh, to help out with this, uh, providing information when that does move forward, is one of the components that was recognized with a lot of communities around North Dakota. It may sound like an issue that we've addressed uh, in the last cu couple of budget cycles is uh, a lot of communities, budget year by budget year, uh, kind of look to scrape by and then wash their hands of the budget is the next year's problem. And I think one of the ideals that they're hoping to, I think, push forward on uh, two communities is that long-term budget strategy because that infrastructure, as it continues to age, capital improvement projects, there has to be a plan in place. And for a lot of smaller communities around North Dakota, that isn't necessarily always possible. Uh, and that might be resources that are needed, tools in a toolbox, so on. But um, we had a great discussion, and that might be something that we can help provide on what we've conducted over the last couple of years with planning. Um, not to say that uh, ours is the best, but I, I'd like to think that we're on a, at least on the way down the road in that path, um, taking a look at uh, the long-term aspect rather than just this year. and. You know, it's next next year's council's problems. So, uh, any questions for Mr. Stewart? I'm sorry, Al Alderman Fatagula. Not a question, but a compliment and a comment. Um, I've said this privately, and I wanted to share it publicly uh, and with the, all the members of the council. Um, I'm really pleased with the way Harold, you're starting to communicate information to us. That's been a long-standing issue, uh, trying to find the right balance of of thoroughness versus brevity. And uh, I think what you're doing in your first report and having the department heads do 
is, is a very good first step. And I think as the months go by, as you get more comfortable, um, as we learn to work together, uh, hopefully we'll be able to have some sustained discussions, particularly at a planning or retreat meeting, as to ways of refining that. Because the old ways clearly haven't worked. And uh, all of us on the council and the public need to be informed in a timely manner of what's happening. And what I'm seeing here is an excellent start. So I wanted to commend you uh, publicly and uh, to urge all of us to be thinking about this and to have a, a more sustained discussion in terms of what um, I think the department heads feel we should know, want us to know, in terms of what you need to know from them, in terms of what you want us to know, and in terms of what we need to know on behalf of the citizens. We need to have that kind of broad discussion and broad perspective. Um, so this, I think, is, is, a, is a very good start. I don't see it as busy work like it used to be in the past. It's not the 30-page report that was totally meaningless that you couldn't figure out what was important and what wasn't important. Um, it's brief, which is as it should be, and uh, I'd say it's a, it's a good start in uh, sharing the information in, in a kind of fashion that's going to be uh, usable for everyone. So, so thank you. Any further comments or more questions? Alderwoman Evans. Just for the people who didn't read it, my favorite part was the announcement that um, Public Works made that there is going to there is or going to be free Wi-Fi on our city buses, and um, that is incredible. I love that. That's a you know a great step in you know for our um, residents who who take the city bus now they'll be able to enjoy Wi-Fi. So, so I just saved you five minutes of reading time. That's that's the highlight. <laughs> Further discussion or questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to our next uh, area. This is uh, in our agenda. Uh, consent items, I'm gonna pull 5.1. I do need to add uh, one name to that. Um, any other individual items, 5.2 or through 5.13 that need to be pulled for individual discussion? If not, uh, what are the wishes of the council? Alderman uh, Pittner. Mayor, I move consent on the remaining items. Second. We have a motion by Alderman uh, Pittner, second by uh, Alderman Ross, consent on 5.2 through 5.13. Uh, discussion on the motion. Was that Alderman Janser or Ross? I'm sorry. It was <laughs> Alderman, Alderman Janser. I apologize. Good. Uh, the hairline kind of confused. <laughs> <laughs> Last call for discussion. Please call the roll. Pittner? Yes. Badragula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Evans? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson. Yes. Motion is approved. 5.1 individual. These, these are the mayor's recommendations following appointments uh, to be approved by the council. Uh, you can see that uh, Carrie Candrian, uh, Justin Anderson on the Renaissance Zone. I did want to ask uh, to add Josh Walski to that list after discussions uh, that I did have with the Downtown Business Professionals Association. So those are the three names uh, that I wish to appoint. Move approval. Motion by Alderman Pittner, is there a second? Second. Second by Alderman Ross, this time. Uh, any discussion? Any discussion? Final call. Please call the roll. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Evans? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Motion is approved. That takes us to. Uh, I did have a point of clarification. I forgot yes, to ask on that. Um, what would uh, Mr. Wolski's term be until the December 31st, 2023, like the other two? I believe so. That is uh, the recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Getting a thumbs up from Brian Billings in the back. Yes. Great. Thanks. For the record, yes. We'll make sure that that is uh, apparent. Under our action items, uh, 6.1 this evening is public hearing for taxi license denial. Eddie uh, Liddell, on December 31st, 2020, Eddie Liddell filed an application for a City of Minot taxi driver's license. A background check was conducted, which revealed that Mr. Liddell had a conviction of offense while operating a vehicle driving under the influence. Uh, that was February of 2016. The conviction was uh, noted then on June of 16. The recommendation by the council is to ratify the decision to deny the City of Minot taxi driver's license to Eddie Liddell based on his disqualifying driving record. Again, this is a public hearing, an opportunity for anyone to come forward and speak in favor or in opposition. I believe our uh, chief is here as well. Good evening, Chief Plug. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Um, as you know, we've had several of these that have come before the council, and um, every time I, uh, 
the way the ordinance is written, it's kind of out of my hands to really make a, a key decision on it, but it is, it does say, and I, I attached it to the memo, uh, it's part of our application prop process that um, an applicant shall be denied a license if background examination reveals, and one of those items is um, evidence of criminal activity involving use of a motor vehicle, which a DUI would qualify as one of those items. So in this case, um, he does have a, Mr. Lydell does have a conviction for DUI in 2016. Um, therefore, that's the reason for my denial on this application. Thank you, Chief. Any questions for Police Chief at this time? Thank you, sir. Again, this is public hearing for anyone to come forward and speak either in favor or opposed to the recommendation. Last call. What are the wishes of the council? Alderman Janser. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move we close the public hearing and affirm the decision of the police chief. Motion to close the public hearing and affirm the uh, decision by the police chief by Alderman Janser. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderwoman Olson. Any discussion on the motion? Any discussion? Last call. Seeing none, please call the roll. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Evans? Yes. Motion is approved. 6.2 on our agenda is stacking space approval. Holt Car Wash, Section 11 3J. One of the zoning supplement to the City Minot Code of Ordinances, the zoning code, requires stacking spaces for car washes or those spaces reserved for vehicles waiting in line to be served by the drive through facility to be approved by the Council. The recommendation is approval of approximately 13 stacking spaces as illustrated on the site plan provided in attachment A of the packet. Move approval. Motion by Alderwoman Olson to approve. Second, Second by Alderman Pittner. Any discussion on the motion? Any discussion? Final call. Seeing no discussion, motion is to approve. Please call the roll. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yep. Pagula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Evans? Yes. Jansen? Yes. Motion is approved. 6.3 is the Paving and Utility District 2021-1. This is work item 4585. The, this improvement district is a petition project brought forth by the Minot Park District. The pavement and utility improvements are located on 1st Street Northwest from 19th Avenue Northwest to 15th Avenue Northeast. Approximately 2,000 linear feet of roadway and utilities would serve the impending development of the Magic City Discovery Center, MCDC, and other future district park district developments in the area. Details are included in the engineering reports. The number of uh, recommendations for a pass resolution. Number one is create a paving utility district 2021-1. Two, direct the preparation of the engineering's report. Three, approve the engineering's report. Four, direct preparations of plans and specifications. Five, approve the request for AE2S to provide the necessary engineering services and authorize the mayor to sign the contract on behalf of the city. Six, waive the resolution of necessity in public hearing since all of the district area has petitioned for the project. Seven, approve the plan and specifications and authorize call for bids. And eight, approve the budget amendment and reimbursement resolution. Move approval. Motion by Alderwoman Olson to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderwoman Evans. Uh, discussion on the motion? Any discussion? Final call for discussion. Seeing none, the motion is to approve the paving district 2021-1, uh, work item 4585. Please call the roll. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Evans? Yes. Janser? Yes. Motion is approved. Next item is 6.4, the brick grant application and certification of local match 4087. In 2015, the city began working on a proposed storm sewer assessment district to replace culvert infrastructure around Dakota Square Mall that carries storm flows from Puppy Dog Cooley. Due to the size and cost of the project, it became clear that the project would be difficult to special assess and other funding sources would be needed to make this project come to fruition. 
FEMA has a program called the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, BRIC, that staff believes would fit this project. Uh, we do have two recommendations that the council authorize staff to apply for the FEMA BRIC grant and authorize the mayor and staff to execute the grant application and two to certify the proposed local match from the storm sewer development funds. Mr. Mayor, I move approval. Motion by Alderman Ross to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderwoman Olson. Uh, we do have our city engineer here, Mr. Lance Meyer, that does have a presentation uh, for the project as uh, it was proposed in 15 and uh, it's been a little while. It has, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, council members. I, uh, because of the large capital outlay that we have for this project, I did want to give an update. Um, this is probably the first time most of you have heard about this project other than seeing it in our capital improvements plan. It's been in there for many years, but uh, um, it's just been kind of churning in the background. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity to, uh, to talk through this here a little bit. have to wing it. Might have to. Make it a lot shorter, won't it? Eric said hold on, he's working on it. This is when you tell a joke. <laughs> Engineer tell jokes, you kidding me? <laughs> That's dangerous territory yeah, there. let's not go there. Remind us again how pavement is made. <laughs> <laughs> Kids not sleeping well again. All right. There we go. There we go, okay. A um, little background on this project, so um, uh, what we're looking at doing is an improvement on the Puppy Dog Coulee, um, which is one of the five major drainage basins around the city of Minot. Um, this coulee does have a, a bad history of overland flooding, especially greater than that 10 year storm event. This project uh, is generally between 37th Avenue and uh, Thompson Lake, which is located adjacent to the Wellington. A series of 84 inch corrugated metal pipes um, installed in the early 80s and mid 90s around the mall area um, carry this uh, coulee um, uh, flow about 1300 CFS uh, downstream of 37th Avenue. That's a significant amount of uh, stormwater runoff for uh, one of our coolies. Um, the drainage basin for this project is about 9,500 acres. Um, in comparison, that's about uh, the equivalent of 53% of the city's land area. So this is a very large uh, drainage basin that we're dealing with. If you look at the map here, um, I've tried to uh, give you a picture of what this looks like. That red line that uh, kind of goes through the southwest part of the city, that's the, the middle or center line of Puppy Dog Coulee. That yellow line around um, the blue hatched area is the drainage watershed for this project, that 9,500 acres we're talking about. Um, notice the, the black line that goes in and out, that's the uh, city's um, annexed uh, city limits. Uh, that'll become important here later on when I go through uh, what can and can't be special assessed. So what are we trying to fix? Um, the CMP culverts underneath uh, the mall's access road and, and some of these businesses, they're failing fast. They've been failing for the last uh, probably decade and it's getting to the point now where uh, we're gonna have additional issues. About seven years ago, we did have uh, part of a parking lot collapse into this pipe. Um, so I think it's, it's time that we have to do something. 16th Street Southwest uh, will become submerged by several feet of water for several hours on a, a large storm event, um, generally greater than the 10 year event. On very large events, that 25 year storm and larger um, overland flooding does occur and Several homes and businesses are either submerged or uh, completely surrounded by water. With Trinity Hospital relocating its operation to Southwest Minot, we cannot have um, our second 
busiest street in, uh, in Minot go underwater for several hours. And uh, of course, we have floodplain impacts for numerous homes and businesses in this area. This is a depiction of what that floodplain looks like. So the light blue hatched color is the current 100-year floodplain. That uh, yellow line is the 500-year floodplain. And uh, all of those businesses and uh, homes shown in white are uh, properties that are impacted by this floodplain. So you can see several are completely surrounded um, by water when we have a breakout event like this. Um, so that's a problem that we're trying to solve with this project. So starting in about 2015, we started engineering on this project. Four concepts were developed. One was the no-build option. And uh, three were alternatives for the Dakota Square Mall area. Um, all three alternatives um, have a double 12 by 8 box culvert, which is significantly larger than these two 84-inch uh, pipes. So essentially what we're doing is we're constructing an underground river to, uh, to carry this flow. And of course, we have uh, uh, quite a bit of traffic phasing plans that go along with this project to keep traffic flow going in the area because it'll be quite disruptive. This picture shows the alternatives that we looked at. Um, we chose the east route, which is the blue line uh, that goes through the area um, for several reasons, uh, primarily due to cost and impacts to property owners. This project would open uh, 16th Street faster and uh, also allow for uh, less business impact. So after the project would be constructed, um, you'll notice here this is the post-project floodplain improvement, and it's substantial. Um, we can pull those uh, residential homes out of the 100-year the floodplain based on our modeling, um, and you'll notice uh, right at 16th Street where the pipe would start, um, you know, the, the flow does go underground in that river, and we're able to pull out those businesses from that floodplain. Uh, there's a couple low areas around uh, Marketplace Foods that were really not able to address because they sit so low. Uh, but for the most part, those buildings should be uh, out of the floodplain. Uh, when we finance a project like this, uh, we envisioned when we started uh, the typical storm sewer assessment project where the city would pay half through development fees and the other half would be special assessed. But early on, um, it was becoming apparent that a special assessment project would be very difficult to try to make work in a, in a situation like this. Essentially, this is an urban flood control project and, and not your traditional storm sewer improvement. Um, only about 12% of the watershed is within city limits. And if you refer back to that map that I had, um, in that 9,500 acre watershed, only a very small portion is inside the city that could take on an assessment. So. I don't think it would be right for the city, although we could do it, um, to special assess 100% of the cost to only 12% of the district area. Um, we can hold assessments in abeyance, meaning the city would pay them, and then uh, as property annexes um, go back and assess those properties, but because of the large extent of this watershed, there's absolutely no way we'd ever be able to recover all those costs anyway. So special assessments are essentially um, difficult to do and uh, we're trying to find a different way to pay for the project. Uh, hence the BRIC program. So the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant is made available by FEMA, covers up to 75% of eligible project costs. And we need a benefit cost ratio of, of 1.0 or higher to be eligible for the program. And this is a nationwide competitive grant. Um, currently, our benefit cost ratio is calculated at 1.24. Um, we'd like it to be higher, but uh, we're above one, so we're going to give it a shot. Our estimated federal share is about 9.4 million, with our city share of about 4 million, which isn't exactly 75-25, but there are some costs that we're going to have that aren't grant eligible, so we need to account for those. Um, we're looking at a total of about $13.5 million for the project. Uh, we do have our local share available. We've been saving for this project over time, so we do have cash on hand uh, within our account to uh, pay for this project if, um, if we are successful in the grant. Um, for the timeline here, we're looking at uh, getting this into uh, um, Department of Emergency Services. It's, it's there now, essentially waiting for council to bless this project. Um, they'll review it, make sure it's compliant, and then send that off to FEMA and FEMA would be looking to make a decision sometime this summer. So we'll be able to hear back uh, within a few months, let's hope, and hopefully we'll be successful. Went through it quickly, but uh, hopefully that gives everyone the background of what this project is and where we're at. 
Thank you, uh, Lance, and uh, certainly appreciate uh, taking the, uh, I think taking the option of looking for outside funding where available to help defer those costs locally. And this is exactly uh, part of the conversation that I had with many legislators today in, in addressing long-term infrastructure needs and planning for them. So uh, I greatly appreciate that. Questions for Mr. Meyer? Any questions? Uh, Yes, Mr. Stewart. If I may. So just a couple of questions. Uh, one, what's plan B if this funding doesn't come through? And two, looking at the pictures, uh, putting in those corrugated steel pipes was a methodology back in the 80s and 90s. And uh, in many communities, those are now starting to reach the end of their life and beginning to fail. So I guess my second question would be is, how much longer do you think this culvert has capacity before full failure? And then the third part of my question would be, do we have other corrugated steel culverts within city limits that need to be on a plan for replacement at some point in the future? Mr. Mayor and Mr. City Manager, um, plan B, we have a couple different options. Uh, we could look for some uh, low interest loan financing through uh, one of the revolving loan funds through, um, um, through the state. Obviously there's an interest component to that, so we would prefer the grant funding, but that is an option. Option two would be to uh, continue to save for this project over time and let the storm sewer development account uh, accumulate enough funds where we could go and pay for essentially the whole thing in cash. Or we do a traditional bonding method where we just uh, bond for the project and, and uh, pay for it over time. So we do have several options, um, but we think a, a grant funding project would be uh, most advantageous. Um, CMP pipes, we do have several throughout the city. Um, primarily the large scale ones would be on our existing flood control improvements that we have. Um, the Public Works Department has been very actively addressing those over time and uh, they made several improvements to that. Um, I apologize, what was the third part of your question? Estimated life expectancy of this current culvert? It's not good. Um, you know, it, it could really fail at any, any point. Um, Public Works has been going through and addressing what they can. Um, but if an uh, overloaded semi <coughs> would get a, a real bad piece of that pipe, it, uh, it could have an issue. Um, Public Works actually did walk part of it today. And uh, the condition that looks about the same as it did probably earlier in the year but uh, we are essentially out of time. We need to move forward with the project. Thank you, Lance. Any further questions? Alderman Pittner. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Lance, as far as saving for the uh, project, what's the timeline on saving funds? Where does the, the account stand at this point and how deep is that culvert underground? Um, Mr. Mayor and Alderman Pittner, uh, currently our storm sewer development fund uh, has close to $5 million, I believe, in it. Um, we accumulate about $1.1 million every year. So we'd have to build up for several more years if we wanted to pay um, with that account in cash. And um, I apologize, the second part How of your question. How deep underground? How deep, okay. Um, well, this is a, it's about a seven foot tall culvert and there's places of it uh, that are a couple feet uh, underground, and there's some that are, you know, probably five or six. So it, it varies depending on where you're at on the pipe. Further questions? Mr. Stewart. So with it being in a floodplain, are any of these properties required to have uh, flood insurance by being in the plane? And then will the maps be redrawn once these improvements are made and the floodplains reduced, thereby representing a savings to those property owners in that floodplain? Mr. Merritt and uh, Mr. City Manager, currently um, this floodplain has a Zone A designation. Um, there are several properties that would be required to have flood insurance. Um, this is one of our repetitive loss areas. So we had to document uh, um, this and then that's part of our CRS program is a report on areas like this. Um, we do have a Clomar in with FEMA that was uh, done several years ago, meaning that uh, we've told FEMA what these improvements are going to be. Uh, what the result would be after the project is completed. And so after the uh, improvements are done, we certify that they were built in accordance with that CLOMAR, much like we're doing with the flood control project. 
and then FEMA will remap uh, that floodplain. Further questions? Thank you, Mr. Meyer. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Motion is to approve. Is there any discussion on the motion? Final call. Seeing none, please call the roll. Ross? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Evans? Yes. Dancer? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Padrigula? Yes. Motion is approved. 6.5 is the Professional Service Agreement Amendment for the Monad Area Chamber EDC. On February 20, 2019, the Monad City Council City approved the contract with the Monad Area Development Corporation, MADC, for various economic development services. The contract expired December 31st, 2020. The recommendation to the full City Council was to approve a three month contract extension with the Monad Area Chamber EDC, formerly MADC, Monad Area Development Corporation, for the continuation of economic development services. Mr. Mayor, I move approve. Alderman Ross, motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderman uh, Janser. Any discussion? We do have our uh, Minot Area Chamber EDC. Do you have uh, anything that you want to comment on or just here in case there's questions? Okay. Alderman Pittner, did you uh, have a question uh, or yep, comment? Yep, no, just comments. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I, again, I want to express that I, I believe this is one of the more important um, collaborative efforts that we as a city need to, to, to uh, partake in with uh, in regards to economic development and, and with the, uh, I got to get the initials right here, the acronym, right, M-A-D-E-D-C, um, Chamber, M-A-D-C. Uh, I, I, I believe that this is, this is, this is vital and, and it needs to work and it needs to move forward. I really, really look forward to supporting the the uh, the agreement that that comes forward in a few months. I don't know if I can personally um, support the extension of this agreement um, because whenever we give money to an entity from taxpayers, we're 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 obligated to answer to that. And where do these dollars go, and what we get in return? And and I don't know if we've gotten that um, in the past. I, in, and I look forward to the new agreement and approving that one. And and I hope that that it provides me with the goals and priorities of this organization. I hope it provides me with how how the roadmap for those to be accomplished, um, and 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 what the ROI is for taxpayers um, on this, because I believe it it it, it is there and, and it will be uh, documented and 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 what those uh, and. Um, and, and outlined in that new agreement, um, whether it be tax base growth back to the city and, and economic development or, or, or jobs created. Um, I, I look forward to, to approving that, that next agreement, but in this one, it's an extension of agreement that I don't feel we got the bang for our buck, COVID aside. Um, I, I wanna see more out of this organization. I wanna see a higher return for, for taxpayers and, and, I, and I hope that uh, I'm able to approve the next one in a few months. Further discussion? Just make sure comment as I do sit on uh, the board of uh, what was MADC, now the Minot Area Chamber of Commerce, EDC. Uh, just as a reminder to the council, uh, despite COVID, despite uh, decades of setbacks, uh, intermodal has kicked off uh, and uh, uh, what was uh, kind of a stalemate has now turned into one train of intermodal a week, shipping North Dakota farm products uh, to, to the Pacific Northwest and the Pacific Asian markets, opening up a whole new corridor of opportunity uh, that does equate absolutely into economic development uh, internally. Uh, the next uh, the next step is going to be uh, essentially development of that uh, ag industrial park to further complement intermodal for that specific uh, achievement. Um, I think that that was a monumental task with COVID uh, and then uh, also on top of that merging the two entities together. Uh, merging the two entities together really is has been the focus of the last several months, uh, which is why the board voted to uh, look to this extension for three months as that was a monumental undertaking by the entities successfully uh, in helping to make uh, both of those entities more nimble into one. Um, I'm supporting it. Further discussion? Mr. Mayor. Alderman Ross. If, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the, the port project also has received some significant uh, spotlight coming from the state, the legislature. And I think, I mean, just uh, if, you take, if you take that one success of, of getting the, the port up and going, that is, uh, 
that's one that uh, paves the way for so much development and so much economic development in that area that uh, uh, the best is yet to come out there. And uh, to Alderman Ross, uh, there is uh, work on legislation right now uh, for further state uh, investment for development on that right now. And uh, likely that more information will be coming on that is um, I have not personally had an opportunity to read the bill, but uh, look forward to uh, that uh, probably even tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Alderman Pittner. And, and with all that being said, I look forward to that to all being a part of the new agreement and, and moving a, a great relationship forward. And, and again, I just I'm, I'm excited about the new leadership that that's uh, that's been elected to their board. And, and I, I look forward to all that being a part and working in crafting a, a an agreement that works for both entities. And and I'm excited for what it means for my not so. Final call for discussion. Motion is to approve. Please call the roll. Ross. Yes. Sitma. Yes. Evans. Yes. Dancer? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? No. Pajagula? Yes. Motion is approved. That is the end of our action items. That uh, takes us to number seven. This is personal appearances. This is an opportunity for anyone to come forward and speak on any item that either is or is not on our agenda. One more call for personal appearances to come forward and speak on any item that is or is not on our agenda. Seeing none, we will move on to uh, the miscellaneous and discussion items. I did want to take just a brief moment and uh, touch a little bit on uh, some legislative activities here. As um, I've been down to Bismarck already twice to testify on a couple of different bills. Uh, the first was the bonding bill regarding the Mouse River Enhanced Flood Protection Project. Uh, that took a little bit of a turn yesterday, I believe, when the original bonding bill was pulled. Uh, it was pulled for a lot of very, um, let's call it political reasons. Uh, the appetite for bonding still uh, definitely has uh, some contentious issues within the House side of the legislature. Uh, a different bill was introduced, and the good news is uh, Minot still has a line item in there for our flood, flood protection project. Uh, I do want to make the council aware in the community as we testified on the bo original bonding bill and what we are continuing to move forward on is originally the construction plan as it laid out right now on the funding uh, level from the state and what we hope from the Fed is about a 20 year build, 20 more years to, to complete the Mouse River Enhanced Flood Protection Project. We identified uh, uh, an elevated level of funding that if the state were to able to get to 102.7, if I'm remember, 102 and change million a year in totality for that uh, biennium, for the next five biennium, it takes us from a 20 year build down to a 10 year build on the flood protection. Now aside from getting done 10 years earlier because we're funding it faster and building it faster, it would save approximately $137 million in inflationary construction costs. That cost also does not factor in savings of what would be flood insurance rate increases throughout the entire valley for those that would fall into the new floodplain when that is released. So with that, we are continuing to have our discussions with the House. I did have an opportunity to uh, speak with uh, some, house leader, some of the House leadership today. And uh, the good news is we are still in favor uh, and we have been for a very long time. We've worked closely, um, not only with the Minot legislators, but uh, with legislators from around the state. So there is continued support for the Mouse River flood protection, and we're very thankful for that, and also the SRJB for their, uh, for their efforts as um, the chairman of the SRJB um, was also down there to testify. Uh, one of the other bills that I testified on this morning had to do with a continuing House resolution uh, an effort to repeal the governor's emergency declaration. Uh, I spoke in opposition to that specifically dealing with emergency funding. If a state emergency has been repealed, uh, we would not be uh, we would not be in line for reimbursement from those FEMA dollars for the expenses on our Binex testing with the Monet Fire Department. Right now, that Binex testing, those costs uh, that are above and beyond what we have budgeted for out of our ordinary budget. Uh, they will reimburse 75% of that cost. Also, we're anticipating that there is going to be uh, vaccination clinics coming up on an elevated level. Uh, 
and all of the other tertiary costs that come right along with it. And whether that's this jurisdiction or the county or the schools, uh, there's a lot at stake. Aside from everything else that's been discussed about, and it, there was a lot of contentious uh, testimony for both uh, in favor of repealing and of course uh, for those that uh, ch that uh, do want to see it stay in place as uh, I think there are all but two states that were referenced. I can't verify that, but all but two still have emergency declarations based on the availability of uh, tools from the state to be able to better uh, better better maneuver and um, react to, to react to COVID and the situations if and when they do arise. Um, there is a number of other bills. Uh, the, they capped out at a thousand, and I think that they got pretty close to that throughout the House and Senate bills that were uh, submitted. Uh, we have a number of them, and with that, uh, we still have not gone through and really pinpointed all of the bills as a city on which we need to take a deeper dive on. This might be an opportunity for the full council, and I would hope that uh, we'd be able to get together before crossover to sit down and take a look at bills that have been, uh, that have been identified as um, those that we should uh, act on, those that we should watch, those that we don't need to take action on. Um, Mr. Gettle has been uh, paramount once again at keeping us up to date on what has been going on as the continuing resolution only popped up on our radar uh, really yesterday, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, late the night before. So uh, we, we put testimony together and uh, worked with Mr. Gettle to make sure that uh, everything that was taken care of. Um, there is another uh, run at a bill for, and I forget the number, but uh, I've been in communication, 1182, uh, House Bill 1182, that would be, uh, that would allow candidates at a local level to um, identify a, a party affiliation. Uh, we ran into this last term, and really what it is is uh, trying to identify who's Republican, who's Democrat, who's independent uh, within the local levels. And partisan politics, as we discussed uh, at previous council retreats, just really doesn't belong at the city level. Uh, so as we haven't met, I did want to at least have that discussion tonight to see if anybody has a problem with uh, Alderwoman Evans testifying in opposition to that as it was identified by the North Dakota League of Cities that once one candidate uh, declares a party, those that don't are then put at a disadvantage. If anybody has anything alternative to that, uh, Alderman Pittner. Nothing alternative, I agree with uh, the testimony. We, I, I was in Bismarck and testified with uh, two former aldermen uh, on that bill last biennium, so I appreciate it. I, I agree. No, um, that doesn't belong at the city level. Alderman Janser. And I concur. I think nonpartisan is the is the correct approach for that here at, at uh, the local level. Okay. Um, we I will have uh, Mr. Gettle uh, work with you, Alderwoman Evans, to uh, it's got to be formatted and submitted online. It, prior to one hour before the committee convenes, not necessarily the time of the hearing, but yeah, when the committee draft, convenes. I'll send him in the morning. Perfect. All right. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm also going down to testify uh, at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning on House Bill 1260. This has to deal with emergency declaration. Uh, this is in response, again, to COVID-19. Uh, in short, the bill would declare that if an emergency declaration has been put forth, whether it's executive order by, or by a governing body, that if it has any financial harm placed on uh, anyone affected, that any employee within that government enti entity that makes 125000 or more, does not clarify if benefits are included in that, would forfeit all pay for the period into which that emergency declaration is removed. Uh, as my concerns are with this bill, uh, and I'll relate it directly to the 2011 flood, the moment the emergency declaration went out for the evacuation, that would have spurred or triggered uh, the uh, all salaries be forfeited for those key employees, um, as, as I'm identifying uh, those that are either under contract, those that are in department heads or uh, at that level or even below, depending on where um, 
the benefit factors, the, the benefits factor in because it's not clear. You've got your key employees now either sidelines because of uh, uh, non-pay or you also have a contract that has been breached because uh, they're no longer being paid. And I'll use our CM as that example. And it also doesn't clarify if benefits are suspended because that would be uh, breaching the uh, Health Care Act if you choose not to provide benefits to certain employees. Um, it's one of these that we have to, there, there, there are just a lot of bills that we have to keep our eyes on and that uh, we're working close with Mr. Gettle and some of our lawmakers down in Bismarck uh, to uh, stay on top of. So with that, uh, I'm probably gonna work with uh, our city manager and uh, with the rest of the council to try to pull together. It's not a full retreat but at least something that we can uh, pull together uh, a public meeting right here and just have a quick uh, discussion on some of the different legislation going on uh, before crossover. So I uh, would be happy to answer some questions here. Uh, Alderman Ross. Do we get uh, any type of feedback, weekly reports, anything like that from Mr. Gettle on the activities going down there and pertaining to the bills that are in particularly focused on mining? Um, or Alderman, should we or could we or that's a really good question alderman ross uh so there is a there is a call every friday from the north Dakota league of cities and they have their hit list um that y any any of you are able to log on and i would recommend logging on because they do a pretty good job of identifying bills that would be sp specifically interested for different communities around north dakota and i think that's probably your best the easiest bet to pull that together uh, we are planning on doing a, a very brief call after that kind of a planning for the week ahead for City of Minot uh, on what we're hopefully going to submit testimony to or what we need to go down and testify for. Um, if you're not aware that we are able to testify virtually, uh, and that means um, logging in and having uh, the testimony or, uh, or some sort of testimony uploaded prior to the committee meeting started, the challenge with that, just so that everyone is aware, if the committee meetings run long, they take the testimony from those that show up in person, and if the meeting runs long, those that are online to testify may not be able to, but their comments are taken into the record, which is why I'm going down at 8 a.m., or that's why I'll be there at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning to testify. Thank you. Um, if there is pertinent things that come out of that uh, weekly two o'clock meeting from the North Dakota League of Cities, uh, and, and Mr. Gettle highlights some of those, certainly that the city manager will make us aware of, and we may look to um, some of the council for testimony as well as we move through this. Uh, it's a very active session. With that, is there any other miscellaneous or discussion items before we move into liaison reports? Okay, uh, we'll start over uh, with Alderman Pittner. Uh, Mayor, most uh, all my um, committees meet uh, later this week, so I have nothing for you. Thank you, Alderman Pittner. Alderman Janser. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the uh, County City School District Parks Liaison Committee is meeting next week, so no, no report right now. Alderman Ross. The uh, Zoning Ordinance Steering Committee met on January 13th to go over public and staff comments on the new zoning ordinance. We have uh, one more meeting on January 27th. Then the ordinance will be ready to uh, go to the Planning Commission. And that is all I have. Task Force 21 did meet. Uh, I was late to the meeting and I apologize for that, but uh, a lot of that discussion surrounded uh, change in leadership. Unless there is something else, Alderman Janser, that I missed prior to uh, coming in 20 minutes late. <laughs> uh, no, that was that was a lot of it. Um, we we talked a little bit about the um, uh, response to COVID that the um, that the Air Force is making, both uh, headquarters directed, which is you know where where our uh, Air Force Global Strike Command base and commander take take their um, uh, marching orders from, uh, as well as some of the uh, ongoing. Um, budgetary and um, policy actions with regard to uh, modernization of the triad uh, because um, there uh, are discussions that um, 
the new administration may take a different different view of some of those modernization efforts and so uh, we're very concerned about that and how it might affect uh, things here at our base. Thank you Mr. Janser and uh, one of the other committees that I did have was the uh, Monet Area Chamber EDC uh, where board leadership was voted on and uh, bylaws worked on as well and then uh, as we work towards planning down the road I would expect uh, uh, more evolution to continue moving forward. Uh, and a lot of that will come out, I'm, I have no doubt, with uh, those contract discussions. Alderman, Alderwoman Evans. Um, so my committees aren't meeting but um, till later this week, but the library is one of my committees and just wanted to um, let folks know the library is slowly moving back into normalcy and this week um, expanded its hours back from Monday through Thursday, 9 in the morning till 7 p.m., and Friday and Saturdays, 10 to 5. So um, that's a, a great sign, and um, Director Anderson has been um, very good at keeping up with um, sort of the numbers of COVID and uh, adjusting the libraries needed. So this is a welcome um, step, and we're happy. So Thank you, Alderwoman uh, Olson. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have not um, attended any committee meetings in the last few weeks. There have not been any scheduled. Um, I will be joining Alderman Janser at the Liaison Committee next week, and I do have Sir Space and Planning Council, and I do not have the date in front of me, but it is coming up. <laughs> it is coming up, yes. Uh, Alderman Patagula. The Emergency Resource uh, Committee met a week ago virtually. Uh, I had an interesting presentation by MDU on natural gas and its benefits and hazards. Uh, I am in the middle of participating in a two-day program uh, webinar on uh, threat assessment and site security, which is fascinating. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's really neat. Um, and uh, the Commission on Aging has not met and is lying low because of the very high coronavirus risk to the population that's being served and to those of us on the board. And the County Planning Commission will be meeting this Thursday to look at another draft of the county zoning, uh, planning, whatever, uh, manual and ordinance. And um, yeah, it's, it's hopefully we'll, we'll keep pounding away at it. So that's been it basically. Okay. Well, that leaves us down to one remaining item on our agenda. So moved. Motion to adjourn. Pittner makes motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderman Jantz, sir. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. We're adjourned. Aye.